right, welcome to the Raw Bras podcast. I'm here with uh, a good friend of ours, Jake Ducey, and this is Danimal. Uh, we originally met in San Diego and uh, became friends quite quickly. He had been following us through our YouTube channel and then started his own YouTube channel, reached out actually for some advice. He was looking for mentors and uh, definitely love his ambition. He's just, he's always looking for more. <laughs> and that uh, became real clear when he um, came to our retreat in Nicaragua. Uh, we had a blast down there. That was definitely a very raw retreat. And uh, yeah, he wrote the book Into the Wind, and he just recently released his newest book, The Purpose Principles. Is that correct? The Purpose Dave? Principles, yeah. And you've had some pretty big people write your forewords. I know one such as Laird Hamilton, a mutual friend of ours. And who? what about The Purple, uh, Purple Purpose Principles? Who did that one? Jack Canfield, who did, created the Chicken Soup for the Soul book, so that was pretty cool. So first, tell us how you got into writing books. I remember you told me a, a pretty inspirational story, how you, I think, knocked on his door or someone else's door to get your book, first book published. Yeah, that was my agent, and I, I'm 19 years old, I dropped out of school, and I traveled around the world, and ultimately I realized, like, man, I need to come back, I need to write this book, and... And so I came back to America and I wrote this whole book. I didn't really know how to write, but I just felt like it was something that could inspire people and really was something that I thought was worth doing with my time. I thought it'd be fun. Wrote this book. I was so excited. I'm like, this is going to touch millions of people's lives. It's going to become a movie and like all these things. And every single agent said no to me, <laughs> literally one after another, like go back to school. This sucks. Like who cares about you basically? And I had one more agent on my list. So a uh, literary agent, a literary agent is a medium for a publisher. And ironically, he happened to live in Cardiff where, of course, he live. And I heard about that and someone told me his address and I printed out my manuscript. I was like, I'm gonna just show up at his house. That's what's, I was like 19, you know? And uh, so I was driving down the 101 and I was so scared. I was so nervous. Like, oh, my God, is he, like, going to call the cops on me? Like, what happens if, like, he doesn't like it and, like, he gets mad at me for coming to his house? Because he didn't know who I was. And I was so nervous. So I stopped and bought a bouquet of red roses. And, uh, I, and then I, I wrote him a handwritten letter and I told him I was going to sell a billion copies, and which is really far-fetched. And I knocked on his door, his assistant answered, I, I see she likes the flowers, I'm all jazzed up, I'm like, yeah, this is going to work. I like go back, I'm like, okay, I think he's going to publish me. I don't hear anything. <clears throat> and I get a call two weeks later, and it's Bill Gladstone, the agent, and he said, hey, this is Bill, uh, I like what you're up to, and I would like to represent you under one condition. Don't ever tell anyone again you're going to sell a billion copies. It robs you of the whole credibility. I was like, okay, okay. And uh, he picked me up and uh, the first book, Into the Wind, did well and, and got me a contract with Penguin Random House for the second. So it was really that thing. You know, I think you and I, we found an affinity and a connection between one another because we both like to do things we're scared of doing. And that was something I was petrified of doing. And after those continuous epic fails, it really opened me up you know, to, to something more out of my life. And that's really what the book is about. I like, I'm trying to highlight a lot of like humble beginnings and failures. Cause I think when we recognize, and I'm sure you learn from Laird that like these people are scared and these people fail and that's really what it's all about. Yep. That's uh that's definitely a good transition for one thing I want to talk to you about. And uh, Timothy recently made a video about it, and I think it's one of the best pieces of advice that I could probably ever give for someone that's uh, interested in success, and that is basically to follow your fears. As long, I'm not talking about, this doesn't follow for surfers or cliff jumpers or bungee jumpers, not to just do the thing that's the scariest thing possible. When, you're, when it comes to harming your physical body, this is not the advice I'm giving, but when it comes to your reputation or it comes to your emotional life or if it comes just to stepping outside your comfort zone and being scared of being judged or whatever it might be as long as your physical body is not going to be in harm i think one of the best pieces of advice is just to do what you're scared of doing and you know follow that whenever whenever that fear comes up that's what you need to do and that's what's that's where real success is is with the end of that at the end of facing your fears and uh 
you're a great testimony of that. How do you, where, how did you come to realize that? You know, it's one thing conceptualizing it, but it's another whole thing practicing it. So how did you like conceptualize that? And how do you, how do you stay uh, true to that? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. And it's the book's divided into 15 principles that these common threads between a lot of the biggest influence. The second one is about facing the fears. And I think it actually came once I finally did it, like the first time. And I was like, wow, that scared me. But I was like, really cool. I felt good. But I think also, I believe, and I read in the book, I believe that the purpose of a goal, like let's say, for instance, we're scared of like taking a step towards a goal or a dream or just something we feel like doing, whether it's like talking to some gal that we think's pretty or it's like making an album and anything in between. I believe the purpose of that isn't the goal, but who we become in the process. And I think facing our fears is the best way we can develop either any skills. Um, and so when I remember that, and I remember like the point of this isn't to get there. The point of this is to like overcome whatever is like making making me not be all I can be. I try and remember those things. And then also just realizing that, man, every time I do do something that I'm scared to do, incredible things start to happen. Like reaching out to mentors and, and Jack was how I met Jack. I just like walked up to him in the middle of an event with 600 people and I was like, hi, my name's Jake, I'm 19, I wrote this book, and you inspired it. And he's like, how? And I was like, I just started quoting him. You say, some will, some won't, so what, someone's waiting. Some will say yes, some will say no, so what, someone's waiting. And I just kept saying next when everyone, you know, I just went on and on. So I believe that I realized that through just trying it one time. You know, it's the same way I think you probably realized that you liked traveling. You like did it one time and you're like, this was cool. I think realizing that and also who you become in the process. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, definitely, uh, I, I would say that me and maybe you, and, and I mean this in a good way, both have somewhat of a addictive tendencies. And I agree, I, what happened is I became addicted to the results of facing my fear. <laughs> It's like the best drug out there. <laughs> There's no hangover. <laughs> yeah. There's no, the really... other day, I did an interview the other day, and they asked me at the end about my fears, and they asked me uh, who I would love to see on the podcast. I said, well, my friend Daniel, <laughs> I think if you want to talk about fear, he's like one of my favorite people. So I think you and I definitely have that in common, but I think for people that don't have that, they're not like, they don't get a trend, they, maybe they you know, don't want to face that thing. I think it's like really just important to consider who you can become in the process of that and and really just just what you're missing out on by not, we already know what we're getting. You know, I know you and I chat a lot about this. Like we already know where we are, the ordinary, the space we're in, but like what's over there? The, the adventure of it I think is important. Yeah, one uh, one simple way I've learned that also is, and I know you know what a fan I am of this, is polar plunging or just taking cold showers. And I think there was a guy that even did a TED, well, I know, there was a guy that did a TED Talk on it, and someone sent me the video because he, he and my friend knew how much I loved doing it. And I thought most of it was pretty basic. Like, obviously, you get a, you get a, it's actually good for your hormones. It's good. It's invigorating. It wakes you up. It's good for your skin. There's a lot of biological and physiological reasons but what I really love the point that he made at the end is if you don't have uh, the ability to step outside your comfort zone in your own home like in the comfort of your own home with a cold shower then like what what makes you think you're going to be able to do it if like hundreds are watching or thousands are watching or millions are watching so it's like his that is one way he practices being uncomfortable so I think it's uh, cold showers is a great way for people to start um, and they can start getting used to that cold feeling and I don't know who it was I think it might have been Paul Check or someone we interviewed and I was talking like, yeah, how do people not go in the ocean every day? Like, I'm more confused by like, here we are in San Diego and, and most of the people are not even going in the water. And someone once told me, he's like, yeah, well, some people just can't handle that level of aliveness. And I was like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. And I, and I think that is probably indicative of how they handle that. It's probably how they handle other things in their lives. Um, so I, I always appreciate a good polar plunge with you. It was just like a, it was our practice. It was just a practice for everything else that we're doing. Yeah, no, that made me, it made me think about, you know, what you guys, your whole thing you guys are about losing your mind and coming to your senses. It's like, 
I think stepping into our fear is a, we're so in our minds about everything. Like we're not experiencing things often. We're thinking about how we're experiencing things. And I think stepping into our fear is like we need to be in such a high level of like coming to our senses, like our sensory awareness that it's like really is a space, as you said, where you can feel alive because you need to get out of your head in order to be at your best. You know, and that's the common thread that I write about in this in this book. Yeah, I know we could, we could talk about this subject for a lot. Uh, just the idea that maybe the mind was originally evolved to protect the being when we were in a time like you know thousands of years ago when we were hunting for for, for getting food was one of our biggest concerns, or safety like during war times was one of our biggest concerns, or like actually protecting ourselves. But now, at least in the United States, and especially in places like San Diego. And that's no longer a concern, and the mind is almost taken over. And you see people now, they're in the jail. of the, they've be, Their mind has become like their own self-imprisonment. And uh, now, I think for us to evolve to even a, a higher ability and a higher capacity and seeing people really reach out and do amazing things, it's because they were willing to lose their mind and connect to their heart. And yeah, whatever way people can do that and get addicted to that result is something that's uh, very important for me and I think very important for the world. And I, uh, I'm imagining that's what a lot of your book is about. I haven't read your book. You said there's 15 principles? Yeah, there's 15 principles that range from like ha- having, a, having a vision or having, having goals to stepping into fear to asking for what you want for communicating and in, in about things you don't want to communicate as you know I, some a practice I've really been able to develop more and more through getting to know you and and attending your retreats so they really all vary and and I think really the core message that I'm sharing is that I believe it's about the process rather than the outcome and in that process there's going to be fear and I think like if anyone gets anything out of it what I what I no, you will get out of it is recognizing all those people that I thought the media says are like so perfect and they, you know, that we, we idolize them. They're actually scared as shit while they're doing everything that they're doing. And I think that that's really freeing when we can recognize that the people that we often our culture looks up to are actually just as scared as us. Like when I interviewed Laird, that was shocking to me. I thought he was going to give me a speech about being fearless he actually gave me a speech about how he's scared and it's about being courageous. And that was like a really big eye opener that really, it changed my life. That's why I asked him to write the forward. I was like, I expect, I had previously, I think thought that part of life was about being fearless. Um, people say, well, either loves there or fears there, but what if there's like a love for fear (laughs) that's there? (laughs) Yeah, that's so. that's probably I can that definitely rings true to me, and I uh, <laughs> totally agree. I think a lot of people that look up to us or look up to you think that too. Like, oh well, they just don't they don't they for some reason they're not scared. And then same thing, like people that we might look up to, if it's Laird, that I just would echo what you said that we all we all face the similar circumstances. Just certain people react differently. Like we all have very similar problems. I I don't call them problems. I try to do reframing and call them challenges. It's just that we react, re, people react differently. And I think that the people that are usually inspirational or motivational are reacting in a way where they're facing their fears. Um, that being said, I, won't, I, probably, I would probably will not read your book anytime soon just with my crazy schedule coming up. So do I don't want, even have a copy to give to you right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean that. In a, in a, sometimes I forget. Like I think our conversations, other people might hear and be like, wow, that was kind of a mean thing to say or that was offensive. <laughs> but after um, us hanging out, especially at the retreat, I think we've learned to just commun- get real, no fluff, not much fluff. But uh, So that being said, what are the principles? Like how would you, if I wanted to summarize your book and then I'll ask you some questions when you do that, when you summarize it, like do you have like literally 15 bullet points you can go over real quickly? And I yeah, can ask you yeah, yeah. I think that the the, the book starts with... All right, a... so before he begins, this is Jake Ducey. He is the author of The Pur- Purpose Principles. That's a kind of a tongue twister. And he's I about to he's summarize. Too high on coffee. The what? I think you're just too high on coffee. <laughs> no, I can handle it. <laughs> um, but he's about to summarize his book for someone that can't read it right now that might want to read it later. And I'll hopefully ask some good they questions. Can't read it all. But you might ask it all, or they can't read it all. But there's audiobooks now for people like that. So. <laughs> yeah, and we do have an audiobook as well. So uh, thanks. <clears throat> um, 
The first principle that I talk about is I, I quote Helen Keller at the start of the book. And Helen Keller says, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. And I think that if we look at people that have either achieved great things or created a great quality of life, they had a direction that they were headed in. And so I think that if we look time and time again at these things, they always have a way, whether it's just to become the best surfer they can be, or they really like music, or they want to get in better shape. They have something they're standing for, a direction that they're headed in. And I think we have a culture that actually teaches us the opposite. It's like, here's your five choices to major in, and then you can either be this, 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 or this. Those are your choices. Pick one of them, and then spend the next 30 years doing it, and then you can retire, and then you can do something different after that. And I think that when we can ask ourselves things like, what makes me feel like myself? Um, in the book, I write about uh, ways to ways to develop visions or goals, which I think are important. As I said, not because of what we get, but who we become in the process, the growth of us. I ask, what would have to happen one year from now for you to look back and say it was your most successful, your most fulfilling year yet? I ask that, and I think it's whether it's like getting in better shape or doing more things that scare you or taking more cold showers or writing a book I think that if we have something to to work towards then we have continuous fears we need to face continuous growth of ourselves another way that I like to phrase that after I was giving a workshop one time there's a bunch of 40 50 year olds and one seven year old kid I asked this question uh, what would have to happen one year from now for you to look back say it was your most successful your most fulfilling year yet this kid he's seven he goes can I say something? And I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I want to say that we live in a world that always wants to make us something other than who we are. So instead of asking what would happen one year from now, no, he said, uh, I want to write a book. That's the answer to the question. And the reason is it makes me feel like myself. Everyone wants me to be something else. So I think a great question to ask in order to find a direction in life is to ask what makes us feel like ourselves. So those are different strategies that I talk about that could potentially help someone in, in developing a vision, developing goals. I think that from there is like regardless of whether we have a, a work we want to move towards, a business we want to create, or we want to get in better shape, it goes back to the original principle about like doing things that scare us. And I share a lot of stories about rejecting rejection, which I think is a really important principle. And I share story like the Beatles were rejected by Decca Recording Studios who said they were unfit for show business. Like Elvis Presley was told by one of the biggest concert promoters in Nashville that uh, he should go back to being a truck driver, which was his original job. And I think that like, I share all these incredible stories like that and I think that rejecting rejection is a really important principle. Um, another one that I talk about is I think something that, you know, I think you and I both are, are really something we're interested in and that's process over outcome. And I actually share Rob Machado's story in that, you know, he, um, process over outcome, Abraham Maslow says that a self-actualized person, a person of like high, um, high realization of their potential is someone who's in process over outcome. They're not attached to the results of achieving goal or failing at it because they're in the process. They're doing something that's wrapping them out of their mind. They're getting lost in this thing they're liking to do. And I share Rob's story because as you and I both know, he was one of the most successful surfers in one of the biggest industries in the world, making millions of dollars, like one of the most favorite fan, uh, fan picks in the world. And he just got sick of it. He was like, why am I basing everything off of results? Like, why do I need to like go compete in a different city every day? And these people judge me and whatever my ranking is, is how much money I make. Like I didn't do this for that. And he moved into a tent in Indonesia on the other side of the world. So, process over outcome, like finding something that you love enough that it doesn't matter what result it is. Like you just, you, you like doing that 
or applying that to even things that we don't really like doing. I think like when we're in process of our outcome, we can get the most out of ourselves. So that, um, just to take a step back, that first principle is the vision, is having that vision? Yeah, I think a direction, a vision, you know, um, people all like to phrase it in a different way, but I, to me, a vision is a direction, for sure. And then you, uh, is number two the facing your fears? Is that how Number two is process over outcome, process. and three is facing fears. Okay, and we talked about the facing your fears, and I liked what you said about the uh, rejecting rejection. It reminds me of this idea that, you know, like, not facing your fears kills much more dreams than uh, failure does. Yeah. <laughs> like learning how to fail successfully, and I do believe when you're in the process, regardless of the, if you're not attached to a certain outcome that you just love what you're doing regardless, surfing is a great example. In reality, any uh, aspiring professional surfers should still have be living their dream regardless if they become professional or not, regardless if they win the championship or not, because what are they doing in the process? They're doing what they love, they're surfing waves. Yeah. And I think that is a key to success because then you're filled with gratitude and you're filled with appreciation when you are uh, doing what you love. And if you get the prize or if you get the trophy, then that much better. But really, every step towards that is its own trophy and its own prize in itself. That every step towards that goal is a step of success. So I definitely believe in that. And that, that is something to think about if you're just climbing a corporate ladder. And you, you're, I've, I, I, I've had friends from college that told me crazy things like, oh, I just have to do this for like 10 more years. I'm like, what the <laughs> freak? <laughs> like, you think you're going to trade? Like, what's more valuable? You think money's more valuable than time? That's like, uh, that is a mistake. That was like uh, this deception that's been sold to us from people that are in control that we really, that people are starting to wake up to now. It's like the whole idea of retirement. Like, why would you even, I don't understand retirement. Like, why would you want to retire if you're doing something you love? And yeah, I, right. I think people are finding that out that the really the people that are really successful have no plans of retiring. None. Yeah, <laughs> at all. Yeah, even the people that are like 80 years old they're like, "Why I'll like when I die, like if you if it's a part of you, I totally I that's what I really share in the book is that process over outcome. Um and I it's it's I thought that was a great analogy between surfing for sure. It's like and I share Van Gogh's story about the dude sold one painting to a friend in his life and like now like people like buy his stuff for like 50 million dollars or something like that and like all he did is just keep doing these things that he wanted to do so I think process over outcome is like one of the most overlooked because we're so folk we're such a results oriented culture and I think that that's like the key to taking our productivity or our success to a next level is actually not really worrying about the success yeah like or that it reminds me of the idea that success is not something you go after. You just become successful in yourself and then you attract it. And whatever yeah, way right. that might be, it might be monetary, it might just be friends, it might be your happiness, it might be your health. But it kind of comes in a holistic package when you become successful first rather than like, then rather than chasing like one specific facet of success. Like if you're only chasing money and that's the only thing you have is defines as a success, I think that's a sure way to fail. <laughs> yeah, right. If if well being and, and being happy is, is the end goal for sure. So like I write about how it's it's you know, I think happiness is like some I think happiness is something that we define that happiness is living on our own terms, you know, rather than like, well, I should do this because that's what I'm ten ten more years here because that's what everyone said to do. So I think that is a really important element, you know, something else that I I think if we're, you know, I know that you have somewhere to go um, after this. And, and I think one of the most important principles, it's the last principle of the book, is asking for what you want. And so I shared Taylor Swift's story in it, which is really, I found it so fascinating. She was a 14-year-old unknown musician that like had this dream of like being a musician for a living and being a positive influence to a bunch of young women. And she had a little demo tape and she her dream was to go on tour with Tim McGraw and she didn't know him or anything like that and she sent in her demo and she called their offices every single day and said hey uh, I was just wondering if I could be the opening act and come on tour with Tim McGraw and like in his head he's like well I don't know I don't even have an opening act he didn't even have an opening act and she called every day and kept asking, like, can I be the opening act? And finally he was like, 
all right, I'll put this stupid mixtape in and put it in. He was like, holy crap, she's good. And he made an opening act and brought her on tour. And that's what launched her career. I think asking for what you want. And I, I think one is a way for us to conquer fears. And I think two, it's a great way to increase the quality of our lives. I think most people don't get what they want because they never ask for it. And so I always, I write in the book about SW, 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 SW. Some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. And I think asking for what we want is, is super important. Um, I think it's one of the most important principles of the book, and that's why I had it last. I think it's such an important part of life. Yep. Uh, you are preaching to the choir with that one. And I, I've, seen, I've seen you in action doing that. It reminds me of things I've done that, I, I think I've been around people like whether we're doing a retreat, it's a crazy place. And you know, like that, people probably think you're not gonna be able to do that. That place is like way too high end or they're already booked. But I, I never have, I usually don't fall for that trap. I still just want to ask. I almost feel like this. I have to ask just to ask, just to see that there's a chance. And yeah. it's amazing how many times I've taken that risk. That it's like the results surprised everyone else, but we're kind of like, yeah, well that's what happened. You know, I agree. Yeah. That's what I asked. How, how would I know if I didn't ask? It reminds me of when I've seen you uh, with some girls that you've <laughs> like, at, at, like at a coffee shop or at a red light where you did some ridiculous. And it kind of reminded me when I was single. I'm not sure what your dating status or anything like that is. I, but uh, regardless of that, it reminded me of when I was single that it's amazing with the results you get when you ask for them. Just yeah. real bold and real nonchalant and real plain and real confident. That you're just asking to see what the possibility is. Um, how if you want to share that story about the coffee shop or that the red light? Well, that was a funny one. Yeah, the coffee shop was a funny one. I saw this. I saw this. It was a while ago. That was like last year. I saw this really right. You and I. I don't know if we were meeting or if I just saw you in the shop. And I remember I walked in. We were sitting at the kind of the bar. And I remember I was talking to you guys, but I was like, that girl is so pretty. I was just like, couldn't stop looking at her. But I was really nervous to go talk to her. Like I had just woken up. Like I didn't even know what I had on. I was definitely not in presentable shape. And I kind of like gave up because I was like, I'm like, I was just too nervous. And I was like, I think you guys were there. And I was like, I'm going to look so dumb if like I walk over there in front of Daniel, you know, all those voices. And I think I, I grabbed my copy and I went outside and she was walking away. And like everything in my mind was saying, don't go talk to her. But I think like a way to really conquer those thoughts, whether it's going to talk to someone you find attractive, asking a boss for a raise or like telling someone that you like whatever, anything like just put propelling yourself into action. It's not like this conversation that needs to occur in the head in order to get there. And so I just was like, all right. And I just like stood up and I was like, excuse me. And she was leaving and she was walking away. And so I ran after her. And uh, she stopped, and I, I think, I, what did I say? I said, um, I said, hi, um, I was just wondering if you wanted to play a game. And she was like, okay. And I was like, how about you tell me your number, and I'll see if I can, rem if I can memorize it. <laughs> and she was like, okay. And she, like, gave it to me, and I couldn't remember it. And I remember she told it to me, like, two or three times, and I was like, hold on. And I pulled a pen out, and I wrote it on my arm. <laughs> it was pretty funny. And... Uh, so I think that like, regardless, I know your brother Nathaniel's like this too. He doesn't even care. He, I know he, he'll ask women a lot or just tell them they're beautiful or just start a conversation or ask for their number. He doesn't really care about even getting their number. He just finds it makes him feel so much more confident in asking for what he wants or expressing himself. And that's what happened to me. I walked away and I was like, cool. Like I feel like instead of beating myself up and kicking myself and not, about not doing something, I did it. Something that was calling to me. Yep. I, uh, I've definitely heard a few special topics in there. One being that you, if I think anyone listening to this or most people listening to this would probably agree that most of the magic takes place outside your comfort zone. And then once again, I can't stress this enough. You have to practice it. You have, if you want to be magical outside your comfort zone, you have to practice that. And it can happen with conversations at a coffee shop, even conversations at a red light. Um, 
and just to practice on a daily basis, kind of how you mentioned, alluded to Nathaniel, how he'll just do it with not even attached to the outcome, but just to practice it. Process of our outcome, for sure. I think Nathaniel has a great example of that. Next book I'll write about Nathaniel <laughs> asking women how. And then the other part that I hear is that, then you can tell me if you agree with this, that when you, that little voice in your head, um, you know, someone like Napoleon Hill might call it the devil, if you've ever read Outwitting the Devil. Um, but that voice, that thing that plants these seeds of fear that really can grow really quickly, that the quicker you can take action without letting the voice talk you out of it, the, the more likely it's going to happen. Like, so when you're that cop, and I, I found this for myself, if I want to have a conversation with someone at the gym, maybe even just about like a, you know, since I'm not like asking for a raise from people, but maybe more of like a, publicity idea like an exchange of numbers an exchange of ideas and sometimes I notice myself I'm like I'll start having conversations and this was definitely true when I was single with women that you kind of alluded to in the coffee shop but you'll start having and Napoleon Hill might say the devil will start telling you like oh like uh well they're, they're in the middle of their workout they don't really want to hear about this or like I don't want to disturb them they probably have so many things going on like they're probably not even interested you'll just come up with all these crazy or someone something will come up with all these crazy reasons not to do it but i found if i can take action immediately like don't even let that my let don't even let that voice come into me then that's it'll be much my results are much better they happen much more often if i can just like go right after it and even if it means like me stuttering or me fumbling over my words or and actually sometimes I'll kind of go into that blackout phase and I'll explain to like, I actually, I, I, you know, you can even tell someone like, I really was scared to talk to you and um, I forgot what I was even going to say now because I didn't want that voice to take over. So I'm just talking to you. Give me a minute. People will be entertained by that. That's like, and I think they're connect to that. I think maybe I learned that from you um, is like, I think that's a great piece of piece of advice too for, for anyone listening is like, when doing asking for something you want or doing something you're scared to do, you can let people know. Like it's not about. I think people connect with that element of like nervousness or fear. Like, hey man, like I want to ask you this, but I'm really nervous about it. But I'm doing it anyway. It's like people are like, cool. It commands respect. Would you agree? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think uh, we both have our gateways to do that. I can say like, hey, I run retreats on getting people to be as honest as possible and I'm going to I'm about to practice what I preach if it's okay with you but I'm pretty nervous about it. like even helping other people is hard for me to do and the same thing with you you know I just wrote a book purpose principles and one of my principles is to face my fears and so I think um, if other people that are listening can come up with that like hey I'm practicing this new thing I learned from this book or I'm practicing this thing that I learned at a retreat and I'm really scared to do it are you okay for me asking you this question I'm nervous like you know having that little introduction and asking people to open their doors rather than barging through it um, because I think sometimes when we try to hide our nervousness or hide our fears, that it comes off a little, it comes off, eek, like it irks people. It's kind of like gross mm -hmm. sometimes. Like if you are really nervous about asking a girl out, I've seen some people, like some men will just get really aggressive. And it's like, uh, that was probably that. The thing is, you weren't really being authentic to yourself. You were really scared and you overcompensated. Not only did you scare yourself, but you like scared that girl away. It didn't really work out. But <laughs> I agree that vulnerability is much more connective. Yeah, no, I thought that last I thought that last story was was super important. Yeah, because when we're scared, we often get into an unconscious mode and then we try and like compensate it in, in some interesting way. Um so yeah, I think I think asking for for what you want is to me that and and realizing it's not about being fearless but courageous are two really of of the most I think important parts of the book that I share and, and all the stories that I share are really to allow ourselves to see ourselves, see yourself in the same light as the world's biggest achievers of today or difference makers of today. Like, wow, that person just like was asked for what they want and that's how they started. Or like they start like even somebody like Jay-Z, like that guy didn't have like a record deal. He nobody would give him a record deal, so he went and printed his albums himself and sold them out of his car. And uh, so I think like that principle of like heart of hard work and through realizing that it doesn't matter where you start is super important. Like one of the principles is just start no matter what. I share Jay Z and Richard Branson's story about being a dyslexic middle school dropout that decided he wanted to create a record label and he didn't know what he was doing. He was dyslexic and, 
and ended up signing the Rolling Stones and the Six and the Sex Pistols and his first song sold like 8 million copies and and it he ended up creating 400 companies and he still like I heard I read an article recently about him where uh he said that he still doesn't know how to read all the financial spreadsheets and he's like running 400 companies and so I think like just starting no matter what and recognizing that you don't need the credentials um, I think is is something to me that's really dear to me because I'm not I just wanted to write you know I'm, I'm not any I didn't like grow up like reading the dictionary or something like that and I think like recognizing it's not necessarily about credentials or being ready and I think that goes back to asking for what you want, facing your fears, going after a dream or something on a bucket list, whether it's traveling or whether it's, you know, learning the violin. I think recognizing that you're not going to feel ready is really important. Like, oh, that's natural. I'm not going to feel ready. I think that's like if I could tell per somebody one thing about going for the dream, like just to let you know, you're probably not going to feel ready when you go for it. Yep, yep, this all makes sense to me. I was, I was actually recalling a recent example, and you may have seen the interview we did with that girl, Teal Swan, who, um, she has a yeah. pretty big YouTube channel, and Diana was going to her synchronization workshop in Los Angeles, and using, from what I'm learning so far about your purpose principles, is uh, I definitely see how they accomplished what I was going for, because I went in there, into that workshop, and the way she does it, she kind of, so she claims and, and you know it could be true that she's extrasensory and can kind of see the vibrational frequency of people and calls on the people that vibrate the frequency that's like most conducive to the whole group and we were like theorizing about that and i told diana's like well you just have to go in there and like no you're gonna be picked that's all like i'll give it I, I think i even said so like, watch i'll get picked and uh I, I i don't know if i predicted it completely but i definitely like i kind of that was my belief so right after the lunch break i just raised my hand like knowing i'm gonna get picked so this is kind of where <laughs> you're saying the vision because there's like, this is a big yeah. room of people. And sure enough, she picks me. And then I'm like, oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> so now it's like the opportunity to face the fears because I'm going into there and I know she has different uh, like spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs than me. So I could have tried to play it safe and just talk about what we might agree upon. But I kind of told her up. I told her right off the bat. And I went to that vulnerable phase, you know, of not, instead of like compensating by being super confident. I kind of told her how like I'm just addicted to making myself uncomfortable. So here I am. Uh... I'll tell you the things I don't think we might agree with, you know, and we would go into it. And and really in the back of my mind, my vision was to kind of collaborate with her and work with her in some way. Um, and I even told her like, yeah, I'm like on stage, like I almost want to just tell people about my YouTube channel. And, maybe, <laughs> and it was just like embarrassed. Like I was definitely embarrassed. I was like with my heart. I mean, I, I, I call it fun, comfortable. I was like fun, comfortable to the max. It was really fun. Really, what most people would call it probably like anxiety and nervousness. But uh, sure enough, after this session, then we email her and I ask her for an interview. And I wasn't sure if she would even do it, but I asked what I want. And sure enough, we have an interviewer. And who knows, like, who knows where that will take me? Those one steps at a time. And we, we got to do a Skype with her and it was an awesome call and hung out with her for like two hours afterwards on Skype. And we'll probably see her. And it's all because having that vision, facing your fears and asking for what you want. So I definitely see... That was just like a recent testimony, but that's probably been a pattern of my life for anything that's been great that I was able to follow those principles. So it sounds like a, a solid structure of a book for sure. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's uh, today we're recording this on what's today? The 29th. Yeah, yeah it comes out January 2nd. So yeah, man, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I think. There's a what I'm I, I was telling my um, friend the other day who's reading it. I said I would be totally happy if someone forgot every single word in the book but did the exercises in it because I think we're not used to asking ourselves what makes us feel like myself or what are things I like to do or what are things I desire. What would be like 30 things I'd like to do in my life? Like one of the exercises is writing down 30 things you want to do, 30 things you want to have and 30 things you want to be in life and I think that those are super hard for us and it's like that's not like hold on let me just jot these down really quick that's like after 10 minutes like oh my god I can't think of anything else and uh, I think like those types of exercises I'm really excited especially for for um, for people who've never 
done anything like that, I think is really powerful to start to ask ourselves questions rather than being out of effect to, to the outside world, asking ourselves questions like, is this what I want to do? Or, you know, what do, what, what does make me feel alive or what are things that are fun, comfortable for me? I think, um, are things I'm really excited about. Yeah. Especially today. I think that this is like the epitome of the age of information where literally I could like listen to podcasts and audiobooks for my whole, the rest of my whole life and probably just scratch <laughs> yeah. the surface of one genre like and never talk to anyone so we are like in a way like we're drowning in information that getting uh, the right information in people's hands and especially if it's information that catalyzes people to take action because I think that's what we need we need people to start taking action rather than like thinking about it all day and then that's what the fulfillment they get I, I, I've any way any I, I'm just so in awe and I, I'm so inspired when people are ready to take action and that's how I try to live my life you know there is some cautionary measures to take but usually the better the more the more action the better especially today because uh it's really easy to drown on the internet or on podcast or on youtube or on facebook news feeds or on anything to distract us it used to be like the tv or the radio with commercials but now they're finding new ways and and you can see that like that uh daze in people's eyes or that that glaze just like so hypnotized by media yeah, they just need stronger coffee. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely things to do, like sleep more and eat less and maybe drink some coffee. But so, anything you can do to take that action and then perpetuate more from that place. Um, yeah, that's really what the book's about. I wrote, I, I filled it with stories. There's stories from anyone from Jim Carrey to Will Smith to Taylor Smith to or to Taylor Swift to Brad Pitt to Bob Marley. There's an extreme contrast. Nelson Mandela to Jay Z. And I share all these stories because I think story, you know, throughout history, throughout different cultures, throughout religion, story is always an incredible way in, in order for us, I think, to see ourselves in other people, to see that we're, you're not different than whoever it is that you admire, someone you look up to or whatever it is. And, and I really, the, the whole intention behind the book and the, the one guarantee that I can make out of the book is you will read this book and you will be like, you may not even finish it. You may just read it and be like, why haven't I been start? you know? And it may just propel you to action either on the 10th page or once you finish the book. And that's the whole intention behind writing it is I think like people say, well, and in the book proposal, they ask for what are the problems that you're solving? And I think one of the biggest problems is we don't think we're ready, qualified enough, or whatever else in order to begin. And that's really what the entire book is about. I think meaning in life and, and um, excitement for life comes from when we start taking action and experimenting. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, purpose principles. <laughs> it's good to hear. It's good to hear you wrote another book already. And how old are you now? 23. 23. I remember uh, last January 2nd, you were joining us in our Nicaragua retreat because we're starting yeah. our next one. I think it, it might be January 3rd, actually, but we got there a little early. Yeah, um, we got there, what, before New Year's? We got there before New Year's. Yeah, the, day our, the day your book comes out is the day we start our Virgin Islands retreat. If I get this uploaded uh, before then, we still have space. So I, I would <laughs> say come down and celebrate with us. But I cannot, sure man. I've got, a big, I've got a big schedule. I'm really excited uh, about the year and... Uh, I think it's a total. I think it's a total testament um, to what happens when you do things you're scared to do. You don't think you're good enough to do them. You don't think you're qualified enough, and you're just like, like there. I I like this. Uh, people, you know, like mantra or whatever. Like Om. I like this one. It's like Om. Oh, what the heck? Do it anyways. Uh, I like that one too. That is good. <laughs> Yeah, so I really encourage everyone to check the book out on Amazon, The Purpose Principles. My name is Jake Ducey. You can find it in, in any bookstore in 2015, just about anyone. Some independents may not take it. But The Purpose Principles, and uh, I highly recommend going to the Raw Bras retreats. <laughs> <laughs> Did, um, I'm, I'm curious, have you ever, uh, what's like one of the times you have followed your principles or faced your fears and you got the like the, what were the worst results you've gotten or like the most challenging results like oh shoot this time it didn't work yeah here's a good one i uh when i came back from traveling as a 19 year old when i quit school and i decided to write this book i came back and i was like 
already got a publisher. This is a done deal. I was acting as if. And, um, which is something I think is important. It's like when you raise your hand, you were like, at, you were like, I already know. And I was acting as if I'm like, I already got my publisher. It was my dream publisher. I don't want to say their name, but let's call them Dream House Publishing. I'm like, I'm already published. I come back and my friends are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm writing a book. I already got my publisher. Like I was very as if. And I was so as if that I took hundreds and hundreds of computer paper. I covered my entire wall and ceiling with 500 flyers that said, I am published by Dreamhouse Publishing. <laughs> I took a visualization to the nth degree. I was like, I even got it all over my wall. It's like you walk into my room and you're like, whoa, he's published by, I like laminated on my shower. It was next to my toilet. Like I put it on my mirror. So when I brush my teeth, it was always in my thought, in my thought process. I'm public, I'm public. Like there was nothing in my room except for flyers. And I was so excited. I, I was like, this is a done deal. So this, this company had a writer's conference and I decided I would buy a ticket to it to give them my manuscript. I didn't care about what they were teaching in the conference. So I show up there an hour and a half early. I'm the first one. I'm just standing at the door, like, just like it's not even open. I'm just standing there. I'm like 19. And, um, they open, I'm the very first seat in there. I'm like, oh yeah, I have like a backpack just full of manuscripts, like manuscript, the eight by 11 print of my book. And the very first thing the founder and the CEO say is they say, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really excited to share with you the way the publishing world works, but you cannot give us your manuscripts. We can't accept manuscripts. And I was like, I was the only reason I came. You know, I was like pissed off. And I just like, I didn't understand. And I sat there for two hours during this event, just like while they just talked about how to publish your book. And finally they're like, are there any questions? I'm like, I just shoot my hand up first. And they're like, point to me. I'm like, and I stand up <laughs> and I stand up and I like announce to the audience and to the people on stage. I'm like, I tell them my whole story, dropping out, writing this book, and it's about like um, going for your dreams, and, and I'm 19 years old, and I think they're the perfect publishing company. I covered my room in affirmations, and I say, uh, so my question is, what should I do? <laughs> and they're like, everyone starts laughing in the audience, and like they're like, well, we can't take your book, and I was just like pissed off. And I, I crossed paths with the founder later that day in a hallway. And she, I noticed she kind of, she was looking at me after that and she gave me her email. And I was, so I got her email. I'm like, this is a done deal. I am published. That's how like you go for your dreams. That's how you do it. And she, her mansion is nearby actually our hometown in San Diego. So I'm like, she invites me over give her my manuscript. We spend the afternoon together. It's going super well. I go home and I'm like, I'm like, it's a done deal that I, I, I did it. I overcame it. And then I got an email. I'm like, guess what? They're going to publish me. I just got the email. I'm like going to open it. And they write me and they tell me, no, <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. And so that was one of the times when acting as if I had an epic fail. And that was before I realized the importance of process over outcome. And the point of a goal is who you become in the process. Like what I'm saying is when your goal, your dream, whatever it is, whether it's just a little desire about ask, asking some gal out or some guy out, or it's something like traveling the world or anything in between, what I'm saying is when it feels stalled, instead of thinking about the results, ask yourself, who do I need to become in order for this to happen? Who do I need to become? What skills do I need to learn? What things do I need to do? Who do I need to become? And I think that goes back to what you were saying at the beginning. It's a, oftentimes it's about being that thing already. So who do I need to become? And so failing at one principle led me to what I think is a more important principle um, that makes everything go around. And I think it leads to a lot more peace of mind, this process over outcome. And I definitely learned, I was crying. I was, I was, it was a big, it was a big fail. 
Well, that's how you fail successfully. <laughs> yeah, it worked out great. I self-published a book and sold them well. And so there's always another way for sure. Yeah, but as long as you were doing what you were kind of pursuing your dream in that process, which was writing and being published, and regardless of that publishing company or not, you still were doing what you wanted to do. Where, you know, all your eggs weren't in the basket of that specific company. It might have felt like a failure, but who knows? I, I believe like God would have a bigger plan and that things are going to, that, that stumbling block or that obstacle can turn into an opportunity. A stumbling block can be the stepping stone to something greater than you even had it in your mind at first. Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. I definitely was believing that, that God had something more in store and that's really what propelled me forward is like recognizing I was that there was something larger than myself at play and I think that's really important to recognize that we don't need to do it all ourselves that there is something larger at work that we may not be able to see or quite understand but there's something larger at play and I think there's an element of faith and trust and like MLK says you don't need to see the whole staircase just take the first step and um, yeah I mean it was crazy because now Penguin Random House it's the biggest publisher in the world and this company was it was not of that big and so it's crazy what happens when we can trust that there's something larger at play when failure after failure happens for sure. So that's a good that's a good way to maybe transition to the end here. Is just you gotta one step at a time, and every step is a step of success. Especially when you're doing what you're passionate about in the process, rather than being attached yeah. to that final step. Unless if you step into dog poop, and then then you could hopefully it's in grass, and it'll fertilize the <laughs> ground even better. Yeah, then it would be a success. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I I uh, appreciate it, dude. It's it's fun to see you because you've been over on the East Coast for quite some time. Yep, yep. Again, it's about to happen. I'm about to start traveling again. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll stop this now. But people can find you at jakeducey.com and go from there or get your book on Amazon. Yeah, jakeducey.com, Amazon, The Purpose Principles, barnesandnoble.com, The Purpose Principles, uh, bookstores, The Purpose Principles. Awesome, awesome. I'm, I'm uh, definitely honored to know you and to be friends with you. Especially, I, I, I don't, you know, I have friends from all ages, like from your age to twice your age, and really more, what, what I judge to be more valuable than like the number. You know, the, this is so cliche, but the their <laughs> the number of years is like the or the you know their years of life is the life in their years. Mm. And it's amazing. You know, people get caught up, especially with young people such as yourself that. Um, they like to write people off for how old they are. Like, hey, he's only 23 years old or he's only 29 years old. That's how old I am. You know, my brothers are younger than me. But in reality, the same people that are saying that are probably people that idolize people such as, or they had idolized people such as Jimi Hendrix or Kurt Cobain or Janis Joplin or Jesus. You know, Jesus was 33. All those other guys were 27. There's this whole crazy club of 27. Have you heard about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those guys were all 27, and people look up to them like they were some of the most talented people ever to live. And uh, to, so 23, 23 is like, maybe maybe you're a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> I write about how, I, in the book, how age has no license on wisdom, age has no license on your abilities, and age has no license on the possibilities for you. Yeah, it's amazing. Like when you really tap into that place of like fully working from your heart and that passion, it's amazing how much it can get done. Like what miraculous things can take place in a day, two days, a month, a year. Um, so to put a number on that or to limit people because how old they are, I think is actually a sign of immaturity for the people doing that. Because you can find some really immature 50, 60, 70 years old, 70 year olds. So uh, yeah, I'm happy that you just have so much life in your years, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's happening next for both for both us and you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, I'll uh, I'll see you soon, and I'll stop recording here. I'll add this in here. Record again. Right when we get off, as usual, then you start getting more. Uh, <laughs> when the pressure gets off, you start talking about funnier things. So we figured we'd add this. That when Jake was at our retreat in Nicaragua. He uh, had this huge plan to, I think, move to Costa Rica, and he was like celebrating the plan and talking about it. And I remember kind of calling him out, like being like, "Well, I have this idea that you talk about." What I was trying to tell him in the time was like, "Yeah, well, what we're doing at the retreat, we're talking about all the things we don't want to talk about because what's sometimes is most personal is most universal, and it's what actually connects us the most. But for our big goals and our big dreams, sometimes by sharing them, you almost get a 
a feeling of fulfilling them without doing them. So sometimes those bigger goals, I, I think that it's best just to keep to yourself and to keep your subconscious or maybe you and your wife or one other person. But when you start talking about it, you might feel like that you already did it. And um, your response, I thought, was pretty interesting about that if you want to share it. But I said, um, I said <clears throat> that, like you were saying earlier, that I think one of the most important things when there's something that you feel like doing is to do it before you talk to yourself about it too much that you think that you've done it or experienced it within your head, opposed to like actually playing it out in 3D and in, in reality. And it, I think it's like that. I know I've seen you post it before that Art Williams speech. Just do uh, it. Yeah, I love that. Just speech. do it. Art. I, I wanna. I wanna write a book. I'm gonna get a raise. This is the year. Great. Just do it. And I think that it's yeah, it's super important. Like, uh, you know, if you read my book and you write down all the things that you want to do um, or have a direction you want to head in, whether it's starting a garden or learning taekwondo or uh, competing with Richard Branson to create the first private space shuttle system. It's important to like literally do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as important as is first getting an awareness and an acceptance of your goals. The next and the most important thing is taking action. Mm -hmm. So yeah, action, action, action. Just do it. Just <laughs> do it. That's a good goal, Jake Ducey. We'll just, just do it. Just do it. If you want to write a book? The purpose principles. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah, like people ask me a lot about like. How do I write a book? Are there certain is there a certain program that you use in order to write? I said uh, Word. I <laughs> I open up a blank document on Word, and yeah, I start typing. It's, it's amazing how that mind that where that part of your mind or like the devil or whatever you want to call it is can come up with all the reasons of why something won't work, and you can just get that analysis paralysis. That uh, yeah. Just, just do it. You want to, you want to find out about the purpose principles? Just do it. Just, just read it. it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to find out what Rob Ross retreat is? Just do it. It's amazing when when it comes to traveling. I have that theory that the one thing people like doing more about than traveling is talking about traveling, because mm. uh, it's so much safer. You can almost relive the memories. You can look at photos. You can talk about it. You can talk about traveling so much. You don't even need to take a trip. <laughs> Just do it. All right. That's a good way to end it. So I'll stop that. 